the book of Jeremiah, it's an intense word, amen? But it's a good word, and I think it's good because, well, it's the word of God, but I think it's good for us because it's poignant for us as a nation, amen? I believe God is speaking to us just like he was to Judah to repent of their idols and get right with God so that they would not have to be brought into captivity. How many like me agree that we do not want to see America brought into captivity? Maybe financial captivity or China. You know, China, it's funny, they act like they're sort of our friends, but then they do crazy stuff. Remember when we got Osama, they stole, they bought the technology of our, our helicopter, remember? I mean, they've done all kinds of little weird stuff like that. They, I was told, someone told me that they, they're trying hard to be able to hack into our power grids. Why would a friend do that? You know, so they kind of want to know how to control us. And uh, I would like, uh, you know, the Bible says, unless the Lord builds a house, the labors labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman watches in vain. How many want God to guard America? Amen. And the way to have God to guard America is to make God the Lord. You know, as it says, blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And we need to make sure He is not just a Lord. He is the Lord in our hearts. Amen. We have no other love besides Him. So today in Jeremiah, turn with me if you would in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 3. And uh, I was going to tell a joke, but uh, I'm not going to. That reminded me too much like another preacher who starts with jokes all the time, so I said no. But uh, this message, because usually I have 10 pages, I have 12 pages, so pray for me. Strap in your seatbelt, hopefully. We'll be out of here by an hour and a half. We should be good. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Some of you go, I don't think so. No, it's a joke. You can laugh. Come on, wake up. <laughs> All right, there you go. But let's pray because I said it's, this is an intense message, but it's a good message. And I think it's very good. The title of today's message is When You Can't, Then You Can. When You Can't, Then You Can. How many know we as Aura Valley and kind of pride ourselves, or Northwesterners, I should say, not of you from Aura Valley, but we kind of pride ourselves. We can do it. We're smart. We're educated. We're go-getters. We're type A personalities. And we're going to see today that in a way that can be very detrimental to the things of God or the kingdom of God. Amen? Sometimes our incredible ability can hinder God being able to freely move through us. And we're going to see that today. So let's pray that we really capture what God's saying and that uh, we really let God change us. Because that's the key. It's not enough just to gather more information and say, yep, that's me, yep, I should do that, and then stay the same. The key is to what? gain more information, and then say, God, that's me. Forgive me, and then help me now to change that area with your strength. That's the key, amen? That's what will change the church. Not just feeling bad, not going, yep, yep, I shouldn't do that, but are you going to stop? No, but I, should, I feel bad about it. That's not enough. It's to change. That's the key. So let's pray that God would speak to us through his word, and then through the power of his spirit, change us in the image of his son, our Lord and Savior. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for the sweet time of worship. Lord, I ask that right now our hearts, you would prepare our hearts to just receive you. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit right now would just fall upon us, Lord. We're sealed in the Spirit, but Lord, as Paul said, be being filled. Be filled. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then in the Greek, it means be being filled. Lord, fill us. Just say that to him. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Give me the mind of Christ. Help me to understand. Lead me by your Holy Spirit of truth into all truth, Lord. Kick out the things in me that are not of you and build in me through your word, the washing, the renewing of my mind through the washing of your word. Renew my mind that we would think like you, that we would talk like you, that our hearts, we would know your heart, we would know how you view life. So God, I ask, I commit my life to you, Lord, afresh. And I pray that I would allow my life to be that vessel, that oracle, that you would speak through me and you would speak to me and through me, Lord, that you would make your appeal through me. I wouldn't add my little flavors to it. I wouldn't add anything to your word. And most definitely, like I always pray, I wouldn't take away from your word. Lord, anoint my tongue. Let it be controlled and guided by you, Lord. Anointing means enablement. I need your enablement. I am weak, Lord, but I know you are strong, so be strong in and through me. And I pray for everyone out here, everyone who hears it here downstairs or upstairs or on the internet, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. And I pray that when you speak to them today, which I believe you will, that they would not just say, that's neat, I'll win Bible trivia with that one. But they would say, Lord, whatever you speak to me, I want that area implemented in my everyday life. I want that that truth to be lived out in my life. So Lord, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. 
but with you and through you and abiding in you, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Give us strength to live the Christian life according to your holy will found in your word. In Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Let's do it again. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. There you go. I love it. Verse 3 of Jeremiah chapter 1. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you, verse 5, in, your, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Aren't you glad? I'm sure glad that Jeremiah's mother did not believe in the practice of abortion. Amen? Amen. Aren't you? I mean, I'm so glad. Because if Jeremiah had been born today, there'd be a good chance in America that he could not be born. Amen? That he might have been formed in his mother's womb. He might have been even called before the foundation of earth. But with the so-called choice that women have. Isn't that that amazing to me? I mean, just think about this. This If you want to know the irony of it, of abortion... The, the now National Organization of Women was the biggest proponent for abortion in America. They said if we allow abortion, then every child will be a wanted child and, and child abuse will go down and hunger will go down and, and poverty will go down. How many know that since abortion was passed in 1972 that now child abuse has gone up 400%? Did you hear what I just said? 400%. Because why? Because someone thinks if I could kill you in the womb, why can't I kill you outside the womb? Amen? Because it... Amen? Because it cheapens life. And when you think that way, when you cheapen life, you cheapen the dignity of life that we're created in the image of God, then guess what? Abuse is going to go up. But again, back to the National Organization of Women who fought so hard for it and said it's just a fetus. It's not a baby. It's a fetus. Now in Beijing, because you know they can only have one child in China, so now they do a sonogram, they see it's a woman, and they abort it because they don't want a woman. They want a man to, f- to pass on the family name. So now this same National Organization of Women is now fighting in Beijing for the discrimination against women. Wait a sec, I thought it was a fetus. Isn't that hypocritical? I said there's something about the international date line I think changes it from, you know, here it's a fetus, there it's a woman. Do you see how hypocrisy, you know, I asked my new age aunt who's big on this stuff, I said, can you educate me? How does that work? And she goes, oh, God, oh, God. How do you know? That's not really good for a professor. Let me explain to you today. I said, explain to me how it's a fetus here, but it's a baby being, a woman being discriminated in Beijing. And she didn't. Think about this. The same thing. A woman could go to be going, driving to an abortion clinic. If I slam into her and kill her, kill that baby, I can be charged with vehicular manslaughter. But yet she can kill that baby. Isn't that weird? How is it murder if I hit her when she wants the baby, but she can kill the baby and that's not murder? A little crazy, isn't it? And we need to realize it doesn't make sense. But I'm sure glad, back to my point, Jeremiah would have maybe never been born. Let me give you an example of how many called and gifted people like Jeremiah have been murdered through abortion. Now hear this, if you've had an abortion, there's grace and mercy, amen? I don't want you to walk in condemnation, right? Because the Bible says anyone who's in Christ is a new creation, amen? Old things are past, behold, all things are new. So don't walk in condemnation. I'm talking about people who say it's fine and great, who, you know, you hear the stuff playing games with fetuses, playing catch with the fetus in the abortion clinic. I'm talking about those people. I'm talking about the person that thinks it's a, some kind of... Uh, birth control. That's what I'm talking about. But think about this. Listen to this example of how many call people that we could miss because through abortion in America. There's a traveling preacher and he has a wife and they are living in, in, in incredible poverty. They already have 14 children. They are the Duggars back then. 14 children. Now she finds out she's pregnant with the 15th child. They are very poor and probably be unable to afford a doctor's attention or have a doctor deliver the baby. Considering their poverty and their excessive world population, I'm talking about today, let's pretend it's today, and the number of children they already have, what would this world recommend for them to do? What do you think would be the recommendation? To abort the baby, amen? Abort it. Maybe adoption, but probably abort it. Hear this. If they would have aborted that baby, they would have just aborted 
Charles Wesley of the Methodist Church, the one who started the great revivalist, the great Pentecostal pastor who started the... the, Did you know the Methodist Church used to really be on fire? Isn't that amazing? That should show us we need to be on fire because everyone can get cold. They say a, a movement only lasts about four generations, about 40 years, and then it gets religious. Guess where Calvary's at right now? 40 years. We need to have a new move with the Spirit, amen? So we need to realize, don't think we're, we're beyond it. But Charles, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, his brother, would have been aborted probably. But God, thank God they weren't. And think how much better the world is or blessed because God used them and called them and they were not aborted. Let me give you another example. There was this mother, and I have, might have this a little wrong, but pretty close. There was a mother who had, had tuberculosis. Her um, husband was a drunk and was always gone. And she had one child, she uh, stillborn. She had another child born deaf. She had another child, I think, born blind. And she had another one born, I don't know, had tuberculosis. What do you think the doctor would have said to her if she was pregnant with number five? They'd say, don't have it, abort it. If we'd aborted that baby, guess who we'd aborted? Beethoven. Beethoven, the great composer, Beethoven. Think about it this way. Think how many people, 55 million we're at right now, aren't we? 55, almost 55 million aborted babies in America since 1972. Think of all the people that we've missed because of that. We could have had someone like a, like a Charles Finney that could have brought, America, or brought revival to America. We could have had someone who had the cure for cancer. Do you ever think that? We don't even think that. We just think it's terrible. We don't realize how much we've missed out possibly. Think of how different this world would be without John Wesley. Think of how many souls would not be in the kingdom today if it wasn't for God using John Wesley, if John Wesley had not reached adulthood. We need to think of it that way. We need to realize that we're sort of robbing ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. And we need to say it's not a choice anymore. You know, that's like a choice. That'd be like saying I have a choice to hit myself over the head with a hammer. I do, but it's not very smart. Amen? You would say that's weird. And you'd say, Craig, stop it because it's just too weird. Before Jeremiah was born, the Lord had already called him and was shaping, hear this, and preparing a significant ministry in his mother's womb. The Apostle Paul would also say that he too was ordained and called in his mother's womb. Isn't it amazing that the world knew, like God knew that we'd be talking about this? And he says it in the womb, in the not after, right out of the womb. He says, in the womb, I prepared them. Galatians 1.15, Paul says, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by His marvelous grace. Psalms 139, David says, King David, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, knit me together in my mother's womb. And he said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. How many know that's cool? We need to realize that. We need to realize how important the womb is. God does a lot of work in the womb. Amen? And we need to believe that. Uh, John the Baptist, it says in Luke 1.15, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Do you remember when Mary came in front of uh, uh, John the Baptist's mom? All of a sudden, what happened? The baby leaped in her womb. How do you know that? That's pretty amazing. I mean, how did, how did God let John the Baptist know? But John the Baptist was that sensitive to the Holy Spirit back then that he could just sense that I'm in the Lord's presence and just leaped in his mother's womb. That's how powerful the womb is to God. Just as the Lord had formed Jeremiah, Paul, David, and John the Baptist in their mother's womb for a special calling, a special important calling, so too the Lord has prepared you and I for a special call. And that call was given to us, hear this, before the foundation of the world. And hear this, all we have to do is what we learned last week, Jeremiah 29, 13. Hear that. Write that down of your note taker. Jeremiah 29, 13. That should be a verse for memory. It says what? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Did you hear that? He didn't say, if you're really called, or if you're really cool, or if I choose you. He says, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen? How many like that about the kingdom? It isn't like just for the rich people, just for the smart people, just for the cool people. It's for anyone who will come. Amen? And if you really hear it, James says, is it not the poor that God has chosen to be rich in the, th- in the things of God, or rich in faith? So if you feel poor today, maybe intellectually or poor spiritually or poor in giftedness, then guess what? You're a great candidate to be used by God. All you have to do is say, God, what I have, what little I have, I bring to you and I give it all to you. And guess what? God will use you. 
Amen? Now, you might not be used like, like D.L. Moody was used or Finney, but you will be used in a mighty way to where your life will, as Jesus said, I've come that you may have life to the fullest or my life more abundantly. You will have an abundant life. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I know you weren't, but let's be real. Some of us wake up and we go, oh, more. oh Lord, not another day. We go, oh, wow, another day. But how many of we should wake up going, wow, another day. Another day to fulfill the call of God. Another day to do God's will. But I'll tell you hum- humbly and sadly, a lot of times I go, oh, Lord, another day. The Bible says, I think one of the reasons why we have so many avenues for escape and you know, TV and video games and computers is because, as it says in Proverbs, it says, without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, the people cast off restraint. If you don't have a vision from God of what your life is called to be, guess what? You're going to try to fill up a lot of hours with escape because you're not going to want to realize the dreariness of life without a call of God. Amen? We need to know God's call for us. And the way we do it is by seeking Him with all our heart. Here's another verse, Matthew twenty-two fourteen. It says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Another translation says, For many are are invited, but few are chosen. Now, if you're an extreme Calvinist, you look at that verse, you say, see, God calls many, right? Whoever will come, but he only chooses a few. But that's not, if you really look at the context, don't do it now, but if you look at the context, look at the beginning of verse 1 all the way to 14, you'll realize it's talking about the king, Jesus, having a wedding banquet for his son. And it's, it's a parable, but it's saying for the king's having a, a, a wedding banquet. And he invites all the honored guests, the Jews, but they wouldn't come. And so he gets mad. And they even kill his servants, the prophets. They kill the apostles. And he says he killed them. And then he sent out people to kill them. They believe that's when AD 70, when Titus conquered, uh, uh, conquered um, uh, Jew, Israel and burned down the temple. And then what happened? He then says, go into the uh, the highways and byways and compel them to come in. The good, the bad, anyone. How many like that? How many? No, I'm an anyone. He says, anyone who's willing to come, let them come. He wouldn't make them come, but he says, invite anybody. And the the poor, those who aren't the Gentiles, who are considered by the Jews, nothing. I mean, some rabbi said that Gentiles, we were created to fuel the flames of hell. How many like that one? How, how many like that call? That's my call, to fuel the flames of hell. Hello? You guys awake? It's not a good call, okay? You can go, ooh, you know. But we have to realize is that we, all we have to do is seek Him. Hear this. All we have to do is choose to be chosen. Choose to be chosen. Amen? You say, but, but Craig, what if I'm not chosen? Then you won't, you won't seek Him. But you go, Craig, what if I'm here and I'm, I'm kind of worried about I'm not chosen? Then choose to, choo- choose to seek him and you'll be chosen. I know it's so cool. It's hard to understand. If you're worried about not being chosen, then choose to choose him and you'll be chosen. Does that make sense? Choose to be chosen and you'll seek him. Don't think, well, I don't think I'm chosen, so I can't seek him. No, you choose him. And he says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen. It's not only the cool people. I I mean, think about it. I used to believe, seriously, I might seek the Lord with all my heart, and God's like, I I don't like you. I I I don't want you. The Bible says what? James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God. Surrender your life. Submit therefore to God, and resist the devil, and he must flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will what? Draw near to you. Don't you love that? Whoever will come, drink from the water of life freely. Whoever will come. So if you're here today and you go, Craig, I'm kind of a loser I don't feel like my life is that important. Then guess what? Today you can say, you know what? You'll see by the end of this message, it's good that you feel that way. But all you have to do now is say, God, if you, you know, this is my prayer. You want to hear my deep prayer when I got saved? Here's my prayer. The night before, I almost killed myself. And I said to God, God, I hate my life. I want to kill my life. I want to kill myself. If you can do something with my life, Lord, it's yours. And how many know my life just exploded? Because why? There was no bartering with God. There was no, if you do this for me, then I'll do this. If you do this, it was just like, God, I'm ready, I was ready to shoot myself. And I told you my best friend did. I was ready to kill myself, Lord. But if you can do something with this worthless life, it's yours completely. And God, whew. and I want to tell you this. I think in a way, being in the, the church in America, I've kind of learned to take back my rights. 
I've sort of decreased in my growth. I was talking to Cindy about that. I've sort of decreased because I learned that I somehow, now I have rights. I don't have to surrender everything to God. You know, God doesn't deserve everything. I mean, no, I say he does, but I can hold back some stuff. When I first came to God, I was so broken of myself. I was so tired of myself. I surrendered everything, and God just exploded upon me. And I want to tell you this. I believe the same can be true for me again today. Amen? Amen. If I will surrender. You know, I, I was talking to John. I'll pick on John. So he's not here. And I was saying, John said to me a line. He, he, we conf- he later said, no, you misunderstood me. But I said, John said, well, it took us a while to get to the state. It's going to take us a while to get kind of revived. But if I think of revival or getting right with God, there he is. If I think about getting right with God as kind of like working out, I mean, I can get depressed. Do you ever work out like me? I will work, I'm not now, but if I'm working out, do you ever get depressed? You feel fatter after you do the exercise bike a lot? I will feel fatter. My wife says, honey, I'm working out. I feel fatter. I don't know if it's just because you're concentrating on it so hard, but I mean, I literally go, this is wrong. I'm feeling bigger. My pants feel tighter. This is not right. I want to drop 30 pounds in one week, right? Isn't that how we feel? I mean, and it's like, you know, but how many know in God, this is the neat thing, you can truly, now, I'm not saying you're going to be an incredible preacher in one week, but you can choose today to totally surrender your life and see a mighty move of God in your life. Amen? Amen. It isn't like working out where you have to, you know, running for God. What are you doing? I'm running for God. I'm on the stairmaster for God. You know, no, it's just called God. I've been playing games with you, God. I've been holding back my life. And now, God, I give you, I, I seek you with all my heart. Amen? That doesn't, take, that doesn't take weeks and hours and years. That takes a choice today. And isn't that cool? You can get in shape spiritually in one second, one prayer away from being totally committed to God. So John said I misunderstood him, right? You were saying it's going to take time. Anyway, what? To undo, to undo our thinking. But you can get right. You agree, right? You can get right immediately. So it's your choice. It's your choice to be chosen. It's your choice to choose to respond to the call that God has for you and me. And let me give you a little story about this that I think is really cool. Has anyone ever heard of D.L. Moody? Ever heard of D.L. Moody, the great, uh, great revivalist or great um, evangelist of his day? Some say he's probably the best evangelist, you know. Dion, everyone says that Billy Graham touched millions. Well, that was a lot of it was TV. But D.L. Moody went around the world before it was easy to go around the world. And just amazing stories about this guy. I, I just love him. He's, he's my spirit-filled Baptist without the charismaniac part. He, he was filled with the spirit without all the craziness that comes with a lot of churches that are talking about the spirit. I really like D.L. Moody. And uh, I'm going to try to preach a message uh, by his uh, assistant, uh, R.A. Torrey, about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But anyway, Dio Moody in the summer of 1872 near Dublin, Ireland, when he and evangelist Henry Valery, hear this, they had prayed all night long. Now, if you ever wonder, why don't we see the move of the Spirit in the church? Why don't we see revival? Why don't we see a powerful move anymore? When I ask you this, then when was the last time you prayed all night long. I can barely get you guys to pray here on Wednesdays for, 15, for a half an hour. Amen? Amen? We need to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of where we're saying, Lord, if you want me to pray all night long, I'll go. Now, how many know that takes a little getting used to? I've never prayed. I mean, I think the most of our prayers maybe from midnight to six in the morning. But to thinking about praying from nine at night to maybe six or seven in the morning, that would be a pretty intense thing, I would say, for me. Very intense. Amen? And I think that would take a little getting used to. But I believe if we really seek Him with all our heart, God could give us that strength. Think about this. This hits me. Remember when Peter was dead tired and, and it's right in the garden right before Jesus was going to be arrested. He went away and prayed and he said, Peter and John, can you watch and pray with me? And it says they kept falling asleep. Do you remember Jesus came back? He said, Peter, you can't even pray one hour with me? You said to me today, you die with me, go to prison with me. You can't even pray one Think about this. Either Jesus is being very mean, which we know he's not, or he, guess what? There was strength for Peter to pray that hour with Jesus. Amen? Amen. He said the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But guess what? If he would have chosen to walk by the spirit, how many know he could have done it? Jesus would not ask him to do something. He'd say, you know, I I know he can't do it, but I just want to make him feel bad. That would be mean, wouldn't it? You know? That'd be like telling, you know, that's like telling someone who's not too smart, be smarter. Could you, I mean, it just doesn't work, you know? 
And that would be very mean if, the, if, if Jesus did that. But anyways, hear this. So they've been praying, and fa- they prayed all night long, and Henry Valley, this evangelist, and D.L. Moody was an evangelist, but he wasn't quite the Moody we know now. And here's what Henry Valerie said, kind of a prophetic word. He said, the world has yet to, we've heard this, but in a shorter version, but here's the true, what was written in D.L. Moody's um, uh, diary. The world has yet to see, this is what Valerie said to Moody, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through a man who is fully and wholeheartedly consecrated to him. Here's Moody's response. Valerie said, Lord, any man. Valerie didn't say he had to be educated. Remember, D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman. He was the Ed Bundy. If you remember that bad show, Marriage, he was a shoe salesman. That was his education. I don't think you have to be a genius to be a shoe salesman. Sorry if you are one. But you don't have to be a genius to be a shoe salesman. What size is that? Remember the little things? We don't even do that anymore. Remember the little shoe things? You put them on there? You know, you know, that's it. And he was that. And he says you don't have to be educated. He didn't say you had to be brilliant or anything else. Just a man. And Lord, I'm just a man. He said, well, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit in me, Lord, I will be that man. Do you see how quick that was? He heard the call that the world has not yet seen. What God, now, I think the 12 apostles were people that had seen, but he's saying lately. The world has not seen lately, he could have said, what God can do through a man or woman is totally yielded to him. Now, hear this, guys. If you really are tired of the way America's going, if you really are concerned about your kids and grandkids, if you really are and just not saying it and then turn on the TV, but you really care, then realize, just like D.L. Moody, you can say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Just like Isaiah, use me. I surrender my heart. That's all God wants. He's not asking you to go to Bible college for five years, ten years. He's not asking you to seminary, uh, MD. He's not asking anything. He's just saying, give me your life and let me work in and through you. Amen? That's all you need to do. He's just asking for a man. Verse 6. And then, then said I, Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Now, scholars calculate the years that Jeremiah prophesied and the fact that he was still alive after the captivity of Judah, that he went, and, and then when he went to Egypt and all, Jeremiah was probably somewhere between 17 and 25 years old. Think about that, 17 to 25 of the max, but 17, people say more young, like 20, 17, 20, when he got the call of God on his life. And that's where the estimates usually range. They said 17 to 25. Now, can you imagine a 17-year-old boy, let's go young, and he, here God says to him, I knew you, let's just put it in Craig language, I knew you even when you were a fetus. Isn't that amazing? When you're just that little baby curled up in the womb, sucking your thumb, swimming around, I knew you. I knew you before you were a twinkle in your mother's eye. I called you before the foundation of the earth and set you apart. Isn't that cool that God did that with you and I? And says, God says, now I'm going to have you talk to the leaders of Israel. And think about this. A 17-year-old is going to go to the leaders of Israel, the king of Israel, and say, if you don't turn from your idols and you don't turn this country back to God, then guess what? Babylon is going to take you captive and you might as well surrender now if you're not going to surrender your life to God. How many know that could be said of America? Amen? Amen. If we don't surrender our life to God now, then realize you're surrendering your children and grandchildren to God knows what. We know at least poverty probably. We know at least probably depression coming soon if things don't change. Amen? Amen. We can't keep doing this. And so if you care like I care, then guess what? All you have to do is say, okay, Lord, if you could use a 17-year-old, I think you can use me. But all he wants is your whole heart. Look throughout the Scripture where it says, with all heart, if you seek with all your heart, with all your heart, wholeheartedly, do all your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for man. Heartily, about heart. And you... Think about this. Only you know when you're giving your whole heart to God. Only you know when you're giving it all. Only you know when you're kind of running a little bit ahead of other people. Like God said to me, I'll look back at other churches and other people, and I go, hey, I'm a little ahead of them, so that's good. God goes, no. That'd be like saying, I'm with all the, you know, uh, I'm the least drunk of the drunks. That's not a good thing. You know? God's saying, you look to me, the author and finisher. You look forward. You look to the Acts church. You look to something great, lofty. You don't just get a little better than the worst. We need to set our sights a lot higher. And how we know 
<laughs> when you set your heart, your sights to be like Jesus, you got some work ahead. You got, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus. But that's the goal, amen. So hear this. He says, "Tell the leader." But can you imagine? Imagine this. How many of you guys are around 17 years old? Raise your hands real quick. Around 17. There you go. We got. There we go. One. We got four. Okay, guys, listen to this. There you go. 17 right there. Listen to this. God tells you, I want you to go to President Obama and I want you to go into his Oval Office and tell him, thus said the Lord, President Obama, turn this country back to God or else this country is going to be overcome by China. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine giving that news, going to President Obama and saying, turn this country around, turn from the many gods, turn from abortion, turn from... From a, from a homosexual agenda, turn from these things or this country will be overtaken by China. I'm sure you would have the same fears. How many, would you have the fears to do that? Would, how many, how many, who would be excited to do that? You'd probably be a little, little fearful to do that. How many? Amen? Would you, Mo? Be a little concerned, right? You'd say, I hope you do it right, but you'd be a little concerned to go to President Obama. Because why? What could happen? You, what? What? <laughs> What'd he say? He said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you can understand how you'd say like Jeremiah some of you guys would say who am I Lord I'm just a kid I'm only 17 year old Obama's not going to listen to me and if he does I might be arrested and at the very least I'm going to be audited <laughs> amen but he marked right like the tea party like like uh like uh you know uh, what is it uh oh uh, what is it Billy Graham Billy Graham is a national treasure. Billy Graham had, President, I think it was President Nixon, gave him Secret Service protection. He has Secret Service protection to this day. Isn't that amazing? Se presidents don't get Secret Service now after Clinton. They don't get Secret Service after they're out of the White House. But, but, but Billy Graham has it because he was such, he was the, you know, he was the pastor to presidents. And yet, you know, and yet, uh, I forgot what I was trying to, the point I was trying to make, but anyway, you know, people don't want to listen to this guy. And as soon as he spoke, oh, this is what I'm saying, as soon as he spoke against homosexual marriage and saying that marriage is between one man and one woman, guess what? The Billy Graham Association got audited. Isn't that amazing? What a coincidence. The very year he came out and said, hey, you know what? He had never spoken about it before. He said, oh, that's not my issue. But how many of you, when you get older, how many of you get more conservative? You do. You go, you know what? We need God, and I don't care what people think anymore. I'm saying it. Amen. You know, I, I want to be old when I'm young. Amen. I just want to. You know, I remember my. I, well, I can tell you a story, but I will. My, my wife would get mad at me. But you know, old people don't care. I want to be one of those old people. You know, I just love it. That's the only thing I'm excited about. Old people. You know, I, I'll tell you the story. Can I hear, can I just tell you the story, please? My grandmother's with my my grandmother's with my great grandmother. They're going to look at a a a, a, um, a um, what do you call it refrigerator. And my great-grandmother bends down to check the lettuce drawer, and a little gas comes out. And my grandma, oh, my God, oh! And she goes, I don't care. I'm just glad to be alive. That's who I want to be, man, you know? I don't care, you know? I'm glad to be alive. I don't care. I'm not trying to impress anyone. I'm just glad to be alive, you know? How many of you have need if we could be young like that? You know, just walk down the hall. I don't care. I'm just glad to be alive for the Lord, you know? But we're like, oh, no, oh, my goodness, what will people think? Oh, like, no one ever does that. <laughs> my wife doesn't, but smells come around, but I don't know where they come from. Hey, I'm just kidding. That was wrong. That was wrong. I'm in trouble now. Pray for me. Anyway, I got in trouble there. I went too far. This is my friends always say to me, go too far. Anyway. She's going to come out right now like John's. <laughs> And that's what the Hebrew word here, youth, means. It means Jeremiah is saying, I'm just a kid. I'm just an adolescent, Lord. I'm a young man. I'm a teenager, God. Why me? You know, can you, why, why do I get this exciting message of turn or burn, basically? Why, why me? Verse 7, But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go and to all who I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. As I said, the title, when you can't, that's when you can. Amen? When you think, I can't, Lord. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. You fill in the blank, whatever it is for you. I don't know the Bible well enough. When you think you can't is when in God you truly can. 
So often it seems that when God called a person for a particular service, they were aware of their inabilities to fulfill the great service that God called them. Think about Moses. Remember Moses? Moses says, Lord, I can't speak for you. I never have. I can't speak. And God says, well, I'll put my words in your mouth. And Finally, God honored him and let Aaron speak a lot for him. But God was saying, I'll fix it. I will. If I call you to do something, like Jesus, if I call you to pray, I'll give you the strength to pray. If I call you to do something, guess what? That can stop. Amen. You know, it's funny. I don't, I don't really advocate um, Oral Roberts. But do you know Oral Roberts used to stutter? And God healed him. That's why he named his name Oral Roberts, because God healed him of stuttering. How many know God can do that? God heals. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if God calls you to something, it's, and I love what, what, what uh, Henry Blackaby said And when we watched the Experience in God tapes. He says, you want to know how when you know a calling is truly from God? He goes, it will always be God's size. It will always be beyond what you could ever do in your own strength. If your calling is just like walk across the street, that's probably not God, okay? But when your calling is I want you to build a, a, a street all the way from L.A. to Hawaii, that's probably God, amen? When it's something impossible, when it's something you go, there's no way I could do that, then you go, okay, this might be God, amen? And so real, but realize the good news is God will never ask you to do anything. He will not empower you and I to do. So many times people are trying to excuse themselves because of the recognition of their own inability, But in reality, God isn't looking for talented, able people. He's just looking for willing, available people. I love what one pastor said. He's not looking for ability as much as he's looking for availability. Amen? Amen. How many can say, I I have that gift. I can be available, right? And if you're not, then guess what? Say this to God. Hey, Lord, if you want me to do this and I'm too busy, clear my schedule. (laughs) How many know God will do that? You know, I, kind of the revival God did with me is he seems to do this to me. Whenever I kind of get kind of just caught in the rut and just kind of doing it in my own strength, he gets me sick. And now it's longer than, it seems like every time it gets longer and longer because I just don't get it. But you know, when you're sick with bronchitis for a month, over a month, you start to go, could it, are you maybe teaching me something? And then it's like, Hello, McFly. You know, and then God starts to speak to me. And I'm not saying that every sickness is of God, but with me, God's usually saying, hello, it's a way of him slowing me down so I can listen to him and go, have I missed something? Is there something you'd like to change? And guess what? When you ask that question, there's usually something God would say, yes, there is a couple things, quite a few things, as a matter of fact, I'd like to change in you, Craig. And that's what God has done. And that's why I believe we're going through the book of Jeremiah, because I wouldn't have gone through the book of Jeremiah. How many could say amen to that? I would not. I wanted Philippians. I wanted the Psalms. I wanted something cheery and fun, and you know, you know, uh, what, what, the, the champion in you. You know, every day is like Friday. I want to do something encouraging. But God says no, Jeremiah, because how many know? As I said last week's title, sometimes the truth hurts, but the truth hurts a lot better than a lie. The lie might feel good for a second, but in the end, the lie could cost your very soul. Amen. amen. I'd rather hear the truth up front when I can still change. Than when it's too late. Amen. He doesn't want us to go forth in our own abilities like Moses. Remember Moses? Moses would realize, I'm a Hebrew. Remember, he realized, I'm a Hebrew. And then he started thinking, okay, I got to help my fellow Hebrews out. I got to help them out. And he sees a, the Egyptian treating a Hebrew bad. And what does he do? He kills him. And then the next day, he, he buries him in the sand, thinking, oh, I got away with it. Nobody saw it. And then the next day, what? Two Hebrews are fighting. And he says, hey, guys, why are you doing this? And they say, well, who are you made you a prince and judge among us? What are you going to do? Kill us like you did the Egyptian? <gasps> You realize, oh no. How many know that's what happens when we try to help God out? Or like when Abraham said, hey, God promised me a son, but maybe he needs, you know, God, you know, the verse, you know, God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible, you know, right? But, you know, maybe I need to help him. And he's, you know, sleep with my servant girl, Hagar. And guess what? The rest is, how many know we're still living that joyous helping God? It's not good to help God. (laughs) Just do what God says. Don't help God. Because if you help God, it could hurt us for a long time. And you a long time. And how many know we're living that for even now? We're still living that. But anyway, where was I? So Moses tried, you know, God's not looking for our own abilities to be like Moses trying to help him out or our own genius, but he wants to trust him as we go forth. He wants to go forth in his power, the power of his spirit, by his spirit's power. So God says here, don't say you can't do it. 
Don't say you're just a kid. Because if I call you, I'm going to empower you to do what I call you to do. So don't say it. I don't want to hear it. I know you're a kid. You know, it was like me. I never forget when uh, I was a youth pastor at the, the Lutheran church down the road. And I was a missionary there. And they finally fired me. Too much Jesus. Can you imagine that? Too much Jesus. And they didn't like that I was leading kids to, to the Lord. And they didn't like that. And so they fired me. And, and uh, I, so all of a sudden we had, you know, had a pretty good youth group, about 50 kids. And everyone says, and adults with it. And they said, what do we do? And I said, go find a good church. Go to Robert Furrow's church. And they go, why, why don't you start a church? <laughs> and I just started laughing. <laughs> that's funny. No, that's, that's just, that's too wrong. You know, I mean, I was like, no, I'm a youth pastor. I'm goofy. I'm not a pastor and I'm too cool to be a pastor. Those guys are weird. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, pastors, senior pastors, come on, let's be real. They're weird. I'm one. Now I can say it. They're weird. Have you noticed that? You get around a senior pastor. They're weird people. And, and I know I'm becoming weird too. Amen. There you go. Yeah. Weirder. But I'm saying is, you know, I don't want to be weird. But here's what, here's what God said. I started laughing at God. I said, God, I can't believe a pastor. And the Lord goes, why, do you not think I know how weird and doofy you are? I mean, do you think God, I mean, everything's laid bare before him. Do you think he's really going, oh, that's right, I forgot, you really are dumb. I don't think he does that. I think he knows, right? He knows us better. He knows our thoughts even where we think them. He knows how we are. And so all we have to do is go, okay, you know what you're getting, so okay, I, I really need a lot of help. That's all you have to really say. Many times... When God lays upon our hearts the things that He wants, has in mind for us, we say, Lord, there must be a mistake. Your angels must have got the wrong address. That You must be delivering your message to the wrong person, Lord. It can't be me you're saying this to. It can't be me. I'm too young. I'm, too, I'm not smart enough. I don't speak well enough. The very hear this, and I want to say this because I think it really applies to us here in Oro Valley. The very confidence that a lot of us have in our own abilities is a lot of times the very thing that disqualifies us from what God wants us to do. Do you know what? I was listening, I think it was R.A. Torrey, where he was saying about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this pastor said, I'm a better pastor than this other guy. I'm a better speaker than this other guy. I'm a better counselor than this other guy. I know the word better than this other guy. And yet God is using him. And why isn't he using me? I am so much better than that guy. You know, sadly, that's been me at times. I, I, sometimes I go, Lord, I had a youth group bigger than this church. I had a youth group of 250 kids. I was the man. What has happened? And that's what I think disqualifies me. Because I think, as Paul says, more highly of myself than I ought. Now, how many know now that I'm getting a little chubbier and a little grayer and older, how many know I'm starting to face reality? I look at that. Just last night, my wife took a picture of me with the kids. I'm like, who is that old man? Who is, oh, that's me. You know what I mean? It's rough. Can anyone say amen? amen. I'm like, I look, I'm like, I understand what my wife's saying. Sit up straight. Put, put your chin, you know, try to fake that chin, you know I mean? Like, do this, you know, like this thing. I mean, it's getting rough. But you know what's great about it? I'm starting to actually realize that I can't do it. That I can't think, God, why aren't you using me? That I really have to say, God, you know what? I don't bring a lot to the table, but all I bring to the table is my whole life. I surrender all I have, and you do what you want in and through me. A lot of times our abilities is what disqualifies us. And I'm not saying don't study, but I'm saying don't have that attitude like you can help God out, amen? Amen. Don't have, have an attitude like, I'm so great. I don't know why God doesn't see what I could do through him if he just let me. That's why God says this, Zechariah 4, 6, another great verse to write down if you're a note taker. And this is a verse you should always memorize. It says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's another way of saying it could be not by human might, nor by human power, but by my spirit's power, says the Lord. Amen? Amen. God doesn't need your help. God doesn't need your power. God needs you to say, God, I can't do this without you. Remember what Jesus said? Apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. But he says what? With me, abiding in me, you can do all things. 
Paul said, through Christ who gives you strength. That's what God wants. God wants you to realize, you know what? Apart from you, I, I might think, you know, how many know there's a lot of men doing a lot of big programs for the name of God, but how many know it's not changing our culture? What's going to change our culture is the move of God. You know what I heard from R.A. Torrey? He said it, and I thought, man, I want this, God. I don't have this. You know what he says the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? You know what he said it is? He said the baptism of the Holy Spirit, remember he says, you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and other most parts of the world? Do you know what that means? He says the power of the anointing of God is not speaking in tongues, healing, and prophecies. He says the real power of the Holy Spirit is to convince, convict, and to convert. How many know we need that power today? Because a lot of people go, amen, I'll hear, yes, Craig, amen. Perfect example, I'll give it. I'll say to you guys, hey, you know, we, we need revival. Yes, amen. And then I say, hey, we need to pray. Yes, amen. How many of you will come Wednesday? No, amen. But you see, the real power of the Holy Spirit is to convince to where you go, you know what? Yes, I've never prayed publicly, but I'm going to do it now through the strength of God because if God calls me to do it, I know he'll empower me to do it, amen? And I'm not doing it to, I mean, it's not like an Olympic thing where people hold up a card going, that prayer was only a one. No, right? Or only a two, right? You're praying to God. And we need to be convinced because you know what? I hear a lot of people say, well, I make you say amen. Some of you go, (laughs) but you know, but I want it to where you say amen and mean it because you're convinced, you're convicted, you're, you're converted. You're saying amen. You know what amen means? It means so be it. Let it be so in my life. Amen. So be it. So when you hear these things, then you should be sort of speaking to yourself. So be it. Let's do this. Because a lot of times we go, interesting, that's so neat. Oh, I'm so happy for Craig. No, it's for us. Amen? Amen. For us. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Ephesians 6.10, I think, captures it good too. It says this, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Notice it doesn't say be strong in yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and then maybe God will empower you. No, it says be strong in the Lord. Why would you need the Lord's power when you realize you can't do it without him? That's when you're strong. When you say, Lord, I need to be strong in you and the strength of your mighty power. Fill me with your spirit. Empower me to do what I could never do in my own strength. Amen? So it isn't a, my ability that God is really looking for. It's a humble person, a humble man or woman, a humble instrument through which he can do his great work. It's that humble. I love what uh, I think it was D.L. Moody who said, the branches that bear the most fruit are the ones who bow the lowest. Did you hear that? The branches who bear the most fruit bow the lowest. It's when we're humble. It's when we realize we're not. You know what D.L. Moody would do? He was one of the best speakers. Everyone wanted to hear D.L. Moody. People would, he one time set up, a meeting during the World's Fair in Chicago and he set up meetings during the World's Fair and guess what? Those meetings were packed out and people said, oh, no one's going to show and they did and guess what? D.L. Moody would speak and then he'd say, there's speakers that are better than me after this and a lot of times he'd let speakers speak before him or he'd give speak engagements away because he believed that other people were greater than him. How many know that's a man God uses? Because he did not think more high of himself than he ought. He, he said, you know what? I'm just a man. I'm just a vessel used by God. And that's why God used him so mightily. If I feel like I can't do it, then that's what makes me more yielded vessel onto him. And then he can use me to the fullest. Amen? So think about it. If you're here today and you say, I can't, then you're in a great place. If you go, but Lord, I can't really serve you. But God, I can't really. All you have to say this prayer. This is a prayer I've been praying lately. Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. I'm willing to be made willing. Just, just you've begun a good work and be completed. Just, I'll, just show me. And I love what D.L. R.A. Torrey said this. I'll try to go faster. But R.A. Torrey said this. He said this. This person, he says, you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Then he says, you need to be totally yielded to God. And he asked this woman, she wanted to go back to Chicago and be a, filled with the Spirit. And he says, are you willing to go back? She goes, I want to go back to Chicago and be the head of my women's ministry. And he goes, no, what if God calls you just to be a servant? What if he calls you just to clean the church? Would you do it? No. And he goes, well, then you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. And he says, but what if I told you that God would help you to surrender to that if you're willing to be surrendered? And she said, okay, pray that God will help me. And she said, God, kind of like the man, Father, I believe, help me. Overcome. She said, okay, Father, change me. And guess what? Boom, she was filled with the Spirit. We just have to be willing we just have to not say, no, God, I'm not, I will not do that. We just have to say, God, that's not what I really want to do. But if it's what you want me to do, then, Lord, give me the strength. 
Give me the desire to do it, and I'm willing to be changed by you. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many see it's all God? I, I see it. Sometimes I put too much on me, you know what I mean, because I kind of fight extreme Calvinism. But, you know, it's both. And it's God who works us to willing to do. We've got to remember that. I've got to remember that. But when the Lord gives me a call, or you a call like Jeremiah, and we say, all right, now, Lord, now we're talking, now we're going somewhere. I can do this for you, Lord. Now it's, uh, you know, how many know that's in a bad place? We're thinking, hey, I can do this, God. I've been waiting for you to see that I could do this. If we say to him, Lord, man, I've been waiting for you. I see what, you can, what I can do for you. I've just been waiting to show you what I can do. I've been waiting for you to see how awesome I am, my awesomeness. I've been waiting for you to see that. Then God says, oh boy, oh boy. I guess he still has a lot of pride that needs to be broken, needs to be broken out of him. That's why God allows breaking and humbling in our lives. You feel like, I had someone once say to me, it's so funny, you know how we can see in other people's lives, but it's real hard for us to see ours. We can always see everyone else's sin. And I never forget this past, you remember this guy used to be at a church, and he says to me, whenever something happens in my life, there's always something that ruins it. And this person was the most prideful person. This person would think, would be like, Craig, I could out-preach you, you know, blindfolded with 103 degree temperature. And this person had such an arrogance. And you'd see every time, there would always be like a stick thrown in the spokes. And I would try to say to this person, I think it's because you're too confident in yourself. You're too prideful. And you know, how many know when you're prideful? Then when you just think, you just go, oh, you're just jealous. <laughs> you know, that's, isn't pride a beautiful? Oh, you're just jealous of me because of, of my awesomeness. I'm like, you just told me that every time you do something, there's always something that gets in the way. And you know, who do you think that is? What does God say? He opposes the proud, puts his hand against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you keep fighting and you keep seeking God and you say, God, I want to do something for you, and they just keep, stop, stop, stop. You've got to ask, if you rebuke it in the name of Jesus, I command that thing to be gone and it doesn't go, guess who it might be? God. God saying, I'm resisting you because you're proud. You're self-reliant. You're self, you have selfish ambition. That's why God, as I said, allows incredible breaking. Nothing apart from Christ that we can then, you know, we can't, I'm sorry, because it's only when we truly believe that we can do nothing apart from Christ, then we can be truly a vessel for God. It takes God a while to beat us down to nothing, to where we realize we're nothing apart from Him, so that He can go ahead and do what He's been wanting to do through us all along. How do we know we can either fight God and keep saying how awesome we are, or we can humble ourselves before God and say, God, you know what? I, I used to think, God, you know, I had to say, God, I, I've thought more highly. I've compared myself to other pastors, and I realize I've been a fool. And it's not easy, and it's not fun to admit that, but how many know if you really want to see a move of God in your life, that's the kind of prayers you need to pray, if it's true. And I just said, God, forgive me. Have mercy on my incredible pride and my incredible arrogance that only, you know, that you've seen all along, but I've fought. You know, I knew when I was a baby Christian, I, one of the first books I read was The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And he has this line in it that's amazing. It says, no man has been greatly used until he's been deeply wounded by God or deeply broken. And I, how many of you say, amen, that's my life verse. I didn't like hearing that, but I knew that was something that I had to hold on to. And I want to tell you, no man or woman has been deeply, greatly used until they've been deeply broken. Look at Moses. Moses was the man. He was in Pharaoh's court. He could have maybe been the next Pharaoh. And guess what? He tries to help God out, and God says, oh, you're prideful still. You're self-confident. And he takes him to the desert 40 years, and he became, listen, a shepherd. Do you realize a shepherd to, a, to an Egyptian was like being an outhouse cleaner outer? It was the lowliest of jobs. Sorry if you are one. But the lowliest of jobs. It was like looked upon as nothing. And some scholars believe that helped Moses even more stuttery. Because he's like, now I'm a total loser. How many of 40 years of being, in his eyes, a total loser is when God says, now you're ready. Now you're ready. So if you're in that state, feel good. Say, man, I'm ready. Say, I'm a loser. I'm ready. I feel, I feel like I can't do a thing. I think I might almost be ready to be used by God. So don't leave feeling bad. Feel good that you feel bad. <laughs> yeah. If you feel really good, say, oh, I feel bad because I feel so good. <laughs> Don't you love it? When God says his ways are not our ways, he means it. Amen. You know, I feel great. Bummer. <laughs> you know, I feel terrible. Good. 
now I can use you, you know? Just go to God. I feel terrible. I don't think I can do a thing without you. You know, not that you can trick God, but you know what I mean? That's the kind of prayers you need to pray, you know what I mean? I try to pray those prayers and God goes, ah, I know you don't mean that totally yet, but you will. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyways, in every service to God, which God calls us, there is a feeling of in, I'm ill-equipped. Oh, Lord, who am I? Like Jeremiah, who am I? I'm just a kid. Who am I? I'm not smart enough. Who am I? I don't know the word of God well enough. Who am I? I can't say it to my boss. Who am I? And God would say, you're nothing. That, that's who you are. Apart from me, you're nothing. But with me, in me, you can do all things through me, and I will do great things in and through you. When you realize, apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen? Amen. That's it. I'm not saying don't have any esteem, but have your esteem in Christ. My value is because God loved me so much he died for me, so I must have value because of Christ died for me, not because I'm my awfulness, but because of Christ. I'm great when I'm yielded and humble before Christ. I'll give you an example of this, and I'm going to end. Is Paul. Think of the Apostle Paul. Let's just go through it, and probably you guys know it better than me, but here's the Apostle Paul. Pharisee of Pharisees, he says. In the law, blameless. Gamaliel, who was one of the best teachers of his day to the Pharisees, he was a rabbi, he was one of the best teachers, and Gamaliel said this about Paul. He said, the only problem, the only fault I have with Paul is that I cannot give him enough books. He just devours books too quickly. And back then, it was expensive, a lot of books, so he basically read all of Gamaliel's books. So he had nothing to read. He said, that's my fault with Paul. That's how smart he was. He was on the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of his day. It would be like being on the Supreme Court of America. He was the man. He was such the man that he was like, I'm going to help God out by killing this sect called the Christians or the way. I'm going to go kill them. I'm going to, pers- I'm going to show you, God, how much I love you. I'm going to kill these Christians. And remember what happened? He's on the road to Damascus. And what happened? God stops him, blinds him with a bright light himself. And all of a sudden he says, Saul, Saul, that was his name before he was Paul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Don't you love the intimacy Jesus has with his church? Why do you persecute me? And Paul goes, yes, Lord. I mean, no, it was so intense. He didn't have to go, hey, who are you? Yes, Lord. Right? That's how intense Jesus is. Yes, Lord. And he surrendered his life to Jesus. How many know this, though? A lot of you don't know this. He was in the Arabian Desert, we know, for three years. But some scholars say he was kind of put on the shelf for three, you know, he was kind of had ministry in and out, but he was kind of put on the shelf for up to almost 14 years. It took God 14 years to undo all his awesomeness. Remember he said, he goes, I was a Pharisee, he goes, but I consider it all dung comparing. You know what that word dung means? It means the really bad word in America. It means blank happens. That's what that word means. He means all of my righteousness in myself is but poo-poo compared to Christ. That's what he says. He's saying that's how much Christ is. I've had to get all that. And he had to be kind of rewired or reconfigured to where he realized I'm nothing. But God said, you know what? Don't worry, Paul. I'm going to help you out. And what happened? Paul had two things. Now here it says one, but we'll hear two things. He had what? A thorn in the flesh. Some scholars, most scholars believe he had uh, like an Asian flu. He had this, this eye problem where his eyes were kind of pussy and leak. And uh, so if you're reading Galatians, says you would have given me your own eyes if you could have. So we kind of know he had an eye problem. But the second thing we have to remember is he also had, wherever Paul went, he had the Herod or the uh, Judaizers who would always follow him from town to town and cause riots. So either where Paul was, there was either revival or riot or both. But there's always people on his case. There's always people giving him trouble. And so we're not sure which one this is. Now we think it's because he was in Lystra. He left the city of Lystra and he was stoned. And he was left for dead. So, you know, these were rocks like this. So it wasn't like little pebbles. It wasn't like BB guns. He was stoned, left for dead. And a lot of scholars think that's when it is, but we're not sure, but that's what they think. But here is what he says. It's in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And here's what Paul says. And you can read the whole thing on your own, but I just want to read this, this part right here. He says, Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, the belief was that he went to heaven when he was stoned and left for dead. So now he's not just Paul, the man who has all his knowledge. He now has gone to heaven. How many of you could get a little prideful? What happens to all our people? I think this, this is a really neat thing. I was reading a commentator last night. Isn't it funny? When someone goes to heaven, what do they do? They write a best-selling book. But what did Paul say? I, I, these are inexpressible things. I can't even mention it. Paul waited 14 years before he said this story to anyone that we know of. He waited 14 years. The only reason he does is because they're talking about the super apostles. He's going, hey, dudes, you impressed by all these visions these guys got? I've gone to heaven. 
And he kind of did it just to show them, you guys are nuts, you're carnal, you're getting, you're worshiping men. I could boast in those things too, but I'm not gonna. How do you know? It would be pretty hard to be humble if you went to heaven. I go, hey, you know what that song, I can only imagine? You don't have to imagine, I know. <laughs> I've been to heaven, I don't have to imagine. You know, could you imagine the pride? When people, you could just snicker at people, <laughs> you have to imagine, I know. I've played in the river of life. I've splashed around with Jesus, I know. But here's what he says. Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, notice, God, keep me from becoming proud. I was given a thorn in my flesh. We don't know which. It could be the eyes. It could be both. But he says, a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Verse 8, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Verse 9, each time he said, my grace is all you need. In a way, you could say, I'm all you need, isn't that? God's grace. I'm all you need. You don't need everything perfect. I'm all you need. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. How many know that's not an Oro Valley word? I'm trying. Could you imagine telling your people, your coworkers, I'm really pray, pray for me. I'm trying to be weak. I'm just, I'm too great. I'm trying to be humble and weak. Can you pray for me that God would make me weak? Make me realize I'm not all that? Can you do that? I mean, what a prayer people are like, we're weird, right? So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Verse 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness. Could you imagine if we took pleasure in weakness? Oh man, that really made me feel humble. That really made me look dumb and weak. That's awesome. I take pleasure in my weakness and in insults and hardship, persecution and trouble that I suffer for Christ. Hear this, the best line, one of the best lines in the Bible, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Now hear that. You hear that, but you don't hear that. Because we try real hard to be strong. If we really believe that, how many know we'd say, it's awesome when I'm weak. It's awesome when I go, God, I can't do this. We think, oh God, help me, I can't do this. Help me, God, help me, please. I gotta be strong, come on, please. Do you see the difference now? Lord, I'm weak. And I think you did this. You put me to a place, kind of like Moses, when, when you kind of hedged him in with the, with the, with the, with the um, Egyptians and he could only go through the Red Sea. You did this. You made it so I would have to depend on you. And I couldn't do it in my own strength. Oh, I get it. You want me to trust you. But what do we do? Oh, no way. I ain't, no, I got to find a way. And we believe that old Benjamin Franklin saying, God helps those who help themselves. No. God helps those who realize, who come to the end of themselves and realize, I need God with all my heart. Amen? Amen. My prayer for you and I is, Lord, let us be weak in ourselves so we can be truly strong in you. Amen? Amen. We're not going to reach this country by human means. We're not going to reach this country through human might and power and human programs. Because look, we have big churches in America, but they're not changing the culture. Amen? Amen? What's going to change the culture is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit only comes to people like you and I when we realize, you know what? I have nothing to bring to the table except my life. That's all I bring is me. And I'm willing to be willing. And I'm willing to do whatever you want. And when you say that, then God will move through you powerfully. Amen? If you want to be used by God, just admit the weakness. Admit it. And just say, God... I, I realize you're using this weakness to make me strong in you. And don't see weakness as weakness. See, weakness is when you think you can do it on your own. That's the true weakness in God. But when you're weak in yourself and you need God, that's when you're the strongest. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Does that make sense to you guys? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your love. And thank you that you are so faithful like your word says in Hebrews 12, 15, that you, that you discipline those you love. And you say in Proverbs, you discipline those you love like a fa father disciplines his favorite son. Thank you, Lord, that you favor us so much that you are committed to break us when we are self-reliant, when we are self-willed, when we have selfish ambition, when we want to show you our awesomeness. Lord, you don't need our help. You just need us to surrender to you. You just need us to say, God, you know what? There's a job to do. There's a great commission to go and make disciples. And 
Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but I feel weak. I feel inadequate. I don't feel like I'm a great speaker. I don't know your word well enough. But Lord, what I have, I bring to you. And I say, God, use me. Use me to your will. Let me be weak in myself that I might be strong in the Lord and the strength of your mighty power. God, I pray that as Oravalians, we would realize that it's not by might, human might. It's not by human power, but it's by your Spirit's power. That's what's going to change our kids. That's what's going to change our grandkids. That's what's going to change our marriages. That's what's going to change this church and this church change the culture when we realize we can't do it. We can't think of a clever program to touch the society. We need an outpouring of your spirit. And you said that that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's when we admit our weakness and admit our dependence on you, that's when you pour out your spirit upon us. That's when you empower us to do things that are supernatural. So Lord, I just repent for my life, for this church, for my kids, for my wife, and for this church body. I, we just repent of our self-reliance, for taking great pride in our strength. And as you said, unless the Lord builds the house, the work and work labor in vain. And we've been working hard, but it's sort of been building our house rather than saying, God, I don't know what to build. Show me. And you said, unless the Lord guards the city, the, the watchman watches in vain. And Lord, we think, oh, I have a gun and, or I have an AR or I have this and I know how to fight and I'm tough. But we know that someone could take us out in a second if it wasn't for you. So Lord, we're prepared, but we're not trusting in the arm of flesh. We're trusting in you to put a holy hedge around us. We're trusting you to deliver us from evil and evil men and women. So God, please, please let this truth, I pray those three C's, I pray for, 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 for convincing, convicting, and converting, Lord. I pray that this message would not just bounce off and, and it would just be forgotten by Monday. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would sear this truth into our hearts and that you would let us believe this verse, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And if we don't understand it, we'd say, Lord, I lack wisdom. Let me understand this verse. Let me realize what it means to be weak in myself that I might be strong in you. God, I'm tired of kind of just spinning my wheels. I'm tired. I feel like I'm in the mud just spinning. I'm working hard. Mm, but I can't move. So Lord, I realize maybe I should get out of the driver's seat and let you drive this car. Maybe you know how to get us out better. And so God, please, we admit we're weak without you. We're weak and we try to do it in our own strength, and we say, God, you take hold of our lives. You take hold of our marriages. You take hold of our children and grandchildren. You take hold of this church. And Lord, as we allow you, as we yield our reins to you, then that's when you can be strong. And we can live, Ephesians 6, 6, 10, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his mighty power. Bless your people, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit of God just right now fall upon them fall upon their homes, fall upon their marriages. And in whatever area you're speaking to them, let them just admit it. I'm weak, Lord. I can't heal myself. I can't fix this financial thing. I can't do it, Lord. Show me what you want to do. I surrender. Speak, Lord. Speak to your people, Lord. Let them hear your still, small voice. Let them know that you are in their midst because you're speaking. I'm not Craig. You are speaking to them. I pray this. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.